For today's Patently Strategic Podcast, we are joined by a very special guest. Robert Cameron is the owner and CEO of MultiWedge, as well as the inventor of some brilliant products sold under the same name. MultiWedge non-prying tools are designed to pry delicate materials without damage. They're wonderful tools for woodworking, electrical wiring, delicate mechanical work, and so much more. Robert's wedges were recently tested by SpaceX and used in the manufacturing process of jet engines at GE Aviation. In a slightly less significance, but much closer to home, found under, under the Christmas trees of several of my relatives this past December. Uh, Robert has molded 1.3 million three-piece sets, 3.3 million single wedges, and has been selling multi-wedge in over 18,000 stores since 2010. Um, as you'll no doubt notice in a minute from his great accent, uh, Robert is a New Zealand native, uh, and he's also a bit of a thrill seeker, having once taken his jet ski from Miami to Bimini Island uh, in the Bahamas. I met Robert back in October at the U.S. Inventor Conference in D.C. Um, I was lucky enough to bump into him over dinner, where he shared his incredible story with me. Uh, one of the funniest and most inspiring stories, uh, inventor stories, I, I think you'll hear. Um, so we just, we had to have him on. Uh, welcome, Robert, and thanks for carving some time out to chat with us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. I love starting at the beginning. Um, what's your origin story as an entrepreneur and what you, got you down the path of non-marring prying tools? Sure. So um, I was obviously born in New Zealand. I did a 8,000-hour um, apprenticeship as a tool and die maker. Um, when I was 22, I decided to go to Australia. And so I spent 10 years in Australia um, working in the gold mines. Uh, working at Aborigine communities, doing mechanical work. Um, I used to travel all over Australia, just doing shutdown work for mining. Um, I've been to the US three different times, and I really loved loved it and the sort of entrepreneurial spirit of the US. So um, in 1994, I decided to immigrate and see if I could invent something. That's great. So um, specifically, what what started getting you focused on the on the prying tools? Right. Um, so I worked for a um, oil tool company in 1997. And um, uh, <clears throat> previously to that, I was doing some construction work and I always um, was leveling stuff and I was using wooden shims and um, <clears throat> different different sort of tools, pry tools to try and align and level stuff. And I always thought it'd be a, a good idea to have a like a wedge and then um, have a handle on it. So um, I, I made a prototype. I've got a couple here. I made these out of wood and um, <clears throat> made them out of friend's shop. And I just got the, the angle right. Um, I'd like to set up put a handle on the end of it. And then... Um, uh, that was the sort of concept for it. And then um, when I was working for this oil tool company, I saw some uh, workers prying some valves, um, these precision valves, and I thought these would make a good pry tool if I made them out of a harder material. So what I did is I made the um, orange set out of uh, polypropylene, and I made the another set out of a really hard um, polycarbonate material, mainly for prying purposes. So um, when I was at my job, I met a uh, gentleman at the Venice Forum in California um, that had a machine shop up in LA. So I took, showed him the product and um, he said, well, if you give me 3000 bucks, you can come up and make the product yourself. <laughs> so I was like really excited. So actually, uh, it's been two and a half years at this company. And they always knew me as the inventor guy. So I came in one day and I said, oh, I'm going to go ahead and um, make my wedges. Um, so I literally backed my truck up, put my toolbox on it, and I said, I'll oh, see you guys later. <laughs> so they were in absolute shock. And they I used to joke around at work all the time. And they seriously thought I was joking. <laughs> and I left and I never, I never saw any of them again, um, except for about probably 10 years later, one of the guys I was really close to, this guy, Tony, he was, um, he'd moved to Colorado and he just got my number off the product 
and he called me up and I hadn't seen him for 10 or 15 years, whatever it was. And he's like, hey, Kiwi, what are you doing? He's like, I couldn't believe it. I was in a O'Reilly's Auto Parts and I saw your wedges. <laughs> he was absolutely blown away. You know, he hadn't heard of seeing me since I got in my truck and just drove off. So um, that was a pretty funny story. He couldn't believe it. It was like 15 years ago I saw you put your toolbox in the back of your truck and I never heard from you. <laughs> he was like, I was always wondering what had happened. So that was pretty, that was pretty funny. Um, what a, like what a, what a, what a great full, what a great full circle moment too, you know? I mean, yeah. I mean no, number one, I mean, you did, you did the thing with that so many people sort of dream of doing quietly, you know, toiling away and, you know, the cubes and benches and things just, you know, if I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to bust out of here someday, I'm going to bust out of here someday, you know, and you, you did it, you did it. Um, and that was pretty, pretty, pretty cool to see that colleague come back, come back around. Yeah. Yep. So then, um, yeah, so I went up to LA and the guy's shop, he was a pretty successful inventor as well. Um, he invented the Shawala car wash mop. I don't know if anyone in the audience remember that back in the mid nineties, I think it was 1995. It was like a uh, blue circle with little feathers made out of, um, car wash material, you know, the blue stuff that washes your car. And he had been really successful with it. And um, he had licensed it to one of these direct TV companies. So <clears throat> I was under the impression that uh, he lived, he had this big, massive, beautiful workshop and all this <laughs> stuff. And I was like really excited. And I met him, you know, like I said, I met him at the Venice Forum. So he's like, come on up, kiddo, you know, come on up, come up to the shop. And, you know, so I went up there on a Saturday and I was driving along and it, the area started not looking too great. And uh, when I sort of pulled in there, I thought I'd come to the wrong address because it was in a uh, not a not a pleasant part of LA. <laughs> it was a really a bad a bad part. And um, so I was standing outside. I was sitting in my truck outside, and I had had my little prototype sitting on the seat beside me. And um, there was a like a, a a chain link you know gate. It was all closed off. You couldn't see. Had a big padlock on it. And I was sitting, I was looking at his business card and I was kept looking. I'm like, am I at the right address? I, I had to take a double take. I thought, I thought this guy had like a lot of money, you know. So um, I almost, almost turned around and left. And I was sitting there contemplating, should I knock on the gate? This can't be right. So anyway, I, I was going to leave and I thought, you know what? You know, I drove all this way up to, um, I was in Artesia. Uh, I might as well just knock on the gate. So I knocked on the gate and all these big bulldogs were like whoa, 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 barking and trying to attack me. And then um, nothing happened. And I was like, well, I guess I'll leave. And then the door opens, this trailer, there's a tra trailer on the lot and this door opened and this guy comes out and his hair's all <laughs> strapped. He's like, who the hell is that? You know, he's like yelling out there. And I said, oh, it's um, Robert Cameron from the Inventors Forum. And um, he goes, who? Who's that? And I go, Robert Cameron, remember? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he goes, hang on, hang on a minute. So he opens the gate, lets me in. And um, it was an old body shop that he had. And he had, um, so he walked inside and he had all the machine tools. You know, he had like a Bridgeport milling machine, a EDM sinker machine, um, lathe. He had all the right equipment. And um, so we got talking about the product and, and he said, oh, you know what, he goes, he goes, yeah, I like that product. He said, I tell you what, you can be 3000 bucks and you can use all the machine and build the mold yourself. And uh, I thought that was pretty neat. I thought that was pretty, and he was a super nice guy. He had this kind of like following of people, he used to follow him around. And uh, he was like an old biker guy, super, super nice. And, um, so that's what I did. So a couple of days later, I went up there in my truck and um, we went down to an aluminum place and I bought these big blocks of aluminum, just a blank chunk of aluminum and uh, went back into the shop there and just literally got a, like a, I've still got them somewhere, like a manila folder and a ruler. And um, Bob actually designed the mold because he's a mold maker. I, I'd done some mold making in my apprenticeship, but not actual plastic injection molds. So he designed the mold and um, I went ahead and um, basically built it. It took about nine months. It wasn't 
like today you would have a CNC machines and it'll be programmed and it'll be done in like two days. This was the old mechanical bridge port lathe. And, um, you know, it was quite a, quite a work environment. Um, he was a bit of a pack rat and uh, the workshop was just a complete chaos. It was about that deep and junk over everywhere. I mean, there was stuff falling off. You know, if you wanted to get a drill bit, it would take you about half an hour to find it. Um, <laughs> super nice guy, like I said, but just a, just a chaotic work environment. And he had all kinds of animals, like he had dogs, chickens, cats. Um, he had a pig. A uh, big pig used to lie in there and you have to stand over it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was absolutely chaotic. But, you know, I didn't have any money at the time. I, you know, I had a couple thousand bucks in the bank. Um, I had no, basically no income at all. Um, and so, I mean, I'd end up buying old, like an old Chevy Lumina with blown head gaskets. And it, I, I bought that. I had it towed there. And, um, you know, when I had some spare time, I was like working on it, changing the head gaskets on it. And, uh, you know, I made three or four hundred bucks on it. And I, you know, that was a lot of money back then, just working on it. And, um, yeah, just to say about the area, um, Bob had some people that stayed with him and they all went out to dinner one night and I was only there about a week or so. And like I said, it was a pretty scary area and I, I was kind of hungry. So I wanted to order a pizza. So I got on the phone there and, um, I think, I think I just when cell phones came out, I got on the phone and I dialed the pizza place and the guy's like, Oh, what'd you like? And I said, um, I get like a Hawaiian pizza. Pineapple, pepperoni, you know, ham, everything. I was really hungry. And, um, he goes, he goes, okay, uh, we'll have it. It'll be about 10, 15 minutes. What's your address? So I said, uh, I gave him the address, 168 Street, Artesian. The phone just went dead. <laughs> I was like, what the, what the, so I called back. I thought, oh, he must have disconnected by mistake. And he, and he didn't take the call. And then when Bob came back, I said, what? What the hell's going on? I said, like, I was a peach and the guy wouldn't even talk to me. He goes, oh, they don't deliver anything around here. Heck, you know. <laughs> it was such, he said, it, it was such a bad area that the cops don't even show up. <laughs> I mean, I kid you not, there were like every night there were helicopters flying around, you know, and the gunshots going off. And, and actually one night I was walking from the shop over to the trailer and, um, these, uh, Gang guys were like shooting bullets off and, uh, and, uh, one ricocheted that went over the top of my head and it actually parted my hair. And I mean, I'll never forget it. It's went, that bullet sound. I went, I could actually feel my hair move. Oh my like, gosh. I, I just jumped down on the ground and like commando <laughs> crawled across <laughs> to the trailer. And I was thinking, wow, this, this inventing product is just not as easy as I thought. Didn't know it was going to be quite so hazardous to your health. the the price the price of the price of innovation. Yep. So um, yeah. So after that, so it took about I, I think about nine or ten months to build the mold, you know, from scratch. Um, so the first idea I had was um, uh, so yeah. So when I when I, uh, I so I ran the mold and I got the parts out and <clears throat> I was sort of um, I, was, I, was, I was a mechanical guy. I had um, New Zealand. I used to have like rally sprint cars and I always worked on motorbikes forever. And I thought the, the first like sort of idea I thought for the fry tools was for um, splitting motorcycle cases. So I had this thing stuck in my head that motorcycle cases like um, being able to have like really thin tips, you'd be able to get them a really tight gap, you know, in the, in the engine casing. Yeah. I thought that would just be, that was like I really got a passion for for that idea, you know. So I actually made this, I, I bought this along. This is the first um, packaging I ever did, and it was done on like an early version of like Publisher, probably. Um, oh, sure, yeah. 2000 or something. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty cute. I just did it myself, and I had it had it shrink wrap. A friend of uh, Bob's at the shop had a... Um, you know, a packaging machine. So I went and actually stuck it on there and um, and shrink wrap it. So this is my very first one. I actually called it Tough Wedge. That was the first name I thought of. Um, so anyway, so my great idea was to 
in my head I thought, wow, if I could get in every motorcycle dealership in the world, you know, it would be just amazing, you know. So I thought this has got to be a, a great, you know, great use for it. So that's what I focused on. So I had a friend that had a uh, motorcycle dealership, I think it was in San Clemente, uh, Sermon Capistrano, I think, Mission Yamaha. So I drove down there. So I got my wedges after like nine months, put them in my truck, a whole box of these, and I went down to the dealership, this guy, John, and I and uh, I said, hey, I've, I've got, you know, he'd heard, heard about me. And I said, hey, can you test these out with your mechanic? And, um, you know, for splitting the cases and stuff, it's not going to damage the, you know, thin casings and stuff. And he's like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Just leave them there. So I left the box there. And um, I went back and I, I came, I went back about two weeks later. So I was telling Bob, he's like, we're all excited, you know, that, I, you know, I was all excited to go back and see what the feedback was. And so I went back and um, I walked in the shop and here's this box sitting on the counter. And I thought, Wow, I wonder how he knew that I was like coming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so nice one to package it up like that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I kind of looked like yeah. I kind of thought, hmm, I wonder how he knew I was coming. Anyway, so I talked to him, I said, Hey, so how'd you like, you know, how'd you like the wedges? You know, I mean, I, my heart was beating. I was like, i you know, spent nine or ten months, like basically no income. And I was standing there, I'm like, you know, he's gonna love them, you know, I'm sure he will. And um, he looked at me and he said, oh, we never use them. We actually have case pullers that we use to separate them. We don't need them. <sighs> so I was absolutely, you know, devastated. I was mm -hmm. like, we didn't. Oh. So I put them in my truck. I don't, I'm not quite sure if I actually uh, cried, but <laughs> I was just devastated. Would have been understandable. <clears throat> yeah. So I went back up to the shop um, and I told Bob and I said, hey, they didn't use them. And he's like, what? And I said, no, they have these case pullers. So, um, yeah, I was, I was just devastated. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what am I going to do now? So Bob's like, well, you know, you got a good job, you know, working for Varco. So I really I really didn't want to go back. Um, so I left it for a couple of days and, um, I, you know, I went back up to the shop and uh, it, was, it was like probably around midnight. And um, I was just like looking at them, and I was thinking, "Oh, that's so such such a disaster." And then I look over, and one of the um, <clears throat> this girl that lived there was um, in the in the machine in the in the machine shop. Yeah, so there were a few people that lived in there, and um, she was one of them that lived in there. Anyway, she had this handbag, and um, I'm kind of looking over the shelf, and I'm looking, and I said, "Hey, Kathy, what what are you?" What are you doing? And she's like, she's like, she opens her handbag up and she pulls out some of my wedges. And um, <laughs> I'm looking at them. And I said, what are you doing with them? And then I looked down and she had a picture frame. And she had the, the orange wedges and she's like prying the picture frame away from the glass. And um, she goes, Kiwi, these are great. These are really great. for like I can pry this, this picture out without, without damaging the frame and stuff. These are really good. And I looked at her and I went, and I just thought that is that is brilliant, you know. What a great what a great idea. So so I went over right away. Went over back over to the trailer and I said, Hey, Bob, Kathy was using these as a um like a pry tool for for this you know wooden frame and stuff. And I said, What about woodworkers? And he goes, Oh, that's a great idea, isn't it? Yeah. He goes, You know, I got a friend that's got a wood shop um down off Pioneer off this boulevard and um. So we went and dropped some, the next day we went and dropped a box of them off at the woodworkers. And um, we went back about a week or week or so later and the guy absolutely loved them. Thought they were really awesome. You know, so they'd, they'd have like really fine finished woodworking. They'd have trims and sometimes they'd glue a trim on and they, they want to move it and they can't because there's really no, no way to get in this tiny little gap. So these wedges, they'd just slide them in there and just give them a nice little gentle tap and they could lift the frame off and reposition it. Mm -hmm. um, so they absolutely loved them. So that gave me some inspiration. And uh, I thought, what a great, I, you know, that could be a great market, you know, as actual for prying, Absolutely. you know, woodwork and stuff. So um, I think a few weeks later, we went to the LA County Fair and there was a... Um, company there called Lee Valley Tools and from Canada 
And um, I went up to the guy and I just had them in my pocket and I said, hey, would you guys want to sell these for woodworkers? And the guy was super nice and he goes, yeah, why not? We'll try it. So um, about a week week or so later, um, we went backwards and forwards and I ended up selling about 8,000 of them in their catalogue. So that was just, I was blown away. I was like, wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's a, that's amazing exposure, right? Because I mean, any, anybody who's, anybody who's doing woodworking has, has that Lee Valley tools catalog, you know, sitting in, sitting oh, okay. in the shop, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that, that was, um, that was kind of a turning point. Um, yeah, it was really, really exciting. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And um, some of my friends used to mess with me and they would, <laughs> they'd call up with this fake voice and pretend they were ordering the like, Hey, or Mr. Cameron, we'd like to order 50,000 <laughs> sets of wedges. And um, and I'd always, I'd always go, yeah, funny, funny. Anyway, one day this, uh, um, I think it was Lee Valley Tools, called up again to reorder. And I thought it was a, uh, a friend of mine messing with me. And um, the lady goes, I would like to order 8,000. And I said, well, you, you can't have them. Sorry. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, what? She goes, this is a multi-wedge? I go, yeah. She goes, I want to order 8,000 of your wedges. We've been selling. I said, well, you can't have any. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. after after a few minutes, I was like, oh, my goodness. Oh, I think it's <laughs> real. And I had, I had to explain to her what, what, what the story was. And she just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, good, 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 thing, good thing she hung on that phone call, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Didn't, give, didn't give up on you? Wow. Yep. So then, um, I think the first trade show I went to was um, in Chicago at the National Hardware Show in 2004. Um, so I, I did a, um, I did a big booth. I'm not a big booth, just average booth there. So that was my first, uh, first real trade show, um, and I got some really good accounts out of that. Um, I got um, like McMaster Car was an industrial distributor. Okay. And um, I've been selling continuously since 2004 with that one contact. Um, so that was that was amazing. I'm actually doing orders today for it. Um, but that's been a you know, consistent sale since 2004. Just you know, every few months or whatever for the whole hey, time. You can't you can't ask for more than that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Con consistent revenue stream like that. It's, it's what it's all about. Yeah. So yeah, that was these. Yeah, you know, I've got some really good accounts that I've had for, you know, some 14, 15 years or longer. Sure. So yeah, just being you know diligent and persistent. Um, you know, you go through quite a few sellers that don't do very well with it for whatever reasons, and then all of a sudden you get a really good account and they just go on and on and on forever and that's that's really good um when i was uh when i first first got into mcmaster car i was um well i think orders came by fax machine sure uh, back back in the day <laughs> and uh i remember i was like i was still working on you know i still i could i couldn't make a living back then you know i wasn't making enough to make a living so um you know in, any orders were just like really really exciting and um so i remember one time i had i used to have the fax machine in my room and i think my master car would order at night time because you know the phone was cheaper or something <laughs> so, so i'd be lying in bed and i'd hear the fax machine go up and go doo, 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 like this and i, I was like t totally broke and uh, I'd hear this thing at about two o'clock in the morning, and I'd just like jump out of bed, I'd, like turn the light on, and I couldn't see, and I'd look at the fax, and it would be an order from McMaster Car, you know, and I was just so excited. And um, and then I couldn't sleep because I was like, wow, you know, five hundred bucks, you know, that was a lot of money back then, sure. a lot of money. And um, so I'd be so excited, I couldn't sleep. And then um, so after a while, I'd get orders, you know, maybe one a week or so. And then uh, sometimes, you know, I'd go to sleep and I'd I'd hear the fax machine and I'd jump out of bed, turn the light on and go over there and there wasn't a fax there. Like I'd actually just kind of dreamt it. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> then I wouldn't get trying to will, trying to will it, trying to make it happen. Yeah, so I wouldn't sleep even when I when I didn't get an order. So, so you know, we talk a fair amount about you know self self bootstrapping. Um, you had a little bit of a side hustle to to keep the bills going, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had this friend that actually used to uh, come and hang out at the the shop. This guy Steve, and uh, he was. Um, <clears throat> He was like a recovering alcoholic guy and a super nice guy we used to hang out. And um, uh, when I when I kind of left the shop after I built, I built a couple of other molds, uh, other ideas, and um, I moved back, to, you know, I was back in Costa Mesa and um, I was doing my online catalogs and, I, you know, I still wasn't making enough. And... Um, I had a friend that I was doing construction for, and I really, I really didn't like it at all. And um, anyway, about six months later, or say, so, this guy Steve rolls up down my driveway, and he's like, "Hey, Kiwi, what are you doing? What are you doing?" Anyway, he dressed up in a plumbing outfit, um, full on like master technician, the nice <laughs> uh -huh. blue, white shirt, and had like Steve on his thing. And I, I look at him, and I go, "Steve, I, like he was actually staying at a rehab." Place that was about a block away, and he just he remembered my number and stuff. That that's how he he, he uh, came over, and he's like he's like he, I said, what are you doing? He's like, dude, I'm making all kinds of money being a plumber. And I said, well, you, you don't know anything about plumbing. How the hell could you get a job? And um, he goes, this place is amazing. You, you don't have to know anything. And I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, he's like, dude, you should come up. You could get a job, you know. You know, it's free working for your friend. You know, making three hundred bucks, you could you could be making like two three thousand dollars a week. And I, I thought he was kidding, you know. Mm -hmm. So he actually brings out these invoices, and sure enough, he, he was making an incredible amount of money. And I was like, and I was like, well, you know, I, I don't want to do plumbing, you know. And, <clears throat> and he's like, anyway, so so he left, and he and he came back again, and um, came back again. He's like, Kiwi, come on, just come up to the up to the office that's up in Burbank. Just come up and um and uh just to see see the see the boys up there. They're really, really cool guys, you know. And um I was like sort of humming and hiring. and I was like, oh yeah, all right, oh let's go. So we drove all out to Burbank and um went up to the like twelfth floor of this building and he opens the door and we walk in and this place looked like a, a NASA control center. It had boards up with projectors with all the plumbers, the top sellers um, had all these dispatches, you know, on the phones. It was just like chaotic. It was just full on. Th this was back just when that big housing boom was was uh, was starting. Okay. And um, so, I, I mean, I, I still had no intention of being a plumber. I didn't know anything about plumbing. So anyway, <clears throat> I go and sit down at this desk, and, and anyway, his, his boss comes over, and his boss comes up and meets me, and hey, Robert, nice to meet you. And um, and he goes, Steve, Steve, give him the, give him the form. I'm like, give me the form. Let's see, what was he talking about? <laughs> so anyway, he gave me this. He's like, Kiwi, Kiwi, fill this out, fill this out. So it's like a 40 question test, you know, multi, multi, uh, multi guest test. So he's like, fill it out, fill it out. I said, oh, I'm not going to fill it out. You know, he's like, come on, come on. So I'm like, all right. So I just go through and I, uh, I go through like the 40 questions, like three pages. And, and then a few minutes later, this boss comes out and he said, he goes, come on, Robert, come to the office. Bring bring that paper. And I'm like, oh, he freaking lined me up for an interview. Like I couldn't believe it. So I go in there and he sits down and he and he goes, hang on, let me let me let me see all the plumbing experience you had. And I said, well, I helped my friend uh, install a bathtub once. I mean, on a construction site. He's like, oh, okay, okay. So he goes through and he marks all the marks all the questions. And he goes, well. You got 39 out of 40 uh, wrong. How about you start on Monday? I was like, what did he just say? So I actually got 39 out of 40 wrong. And he said, come in on Monday and we'll get you a van and a, a uniform and get started. You got a van. That's great. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, at this stage, I was still barely, you know, barely paying my bills. So I was like, oh, you know, I really didn't want to do it. So anyway, I go, I drive all the way back up where Steve drops me off on, on Monday. I go into the office, they give me this like brand new white plumbing shirt. It's like American flag, master plumber, 
like all these badge like certificates and stuff I had absolutely no clue what they were so um had really really nice like uh dark blue pants I, I had to get brand new shoes work shoes so it re really looked the part so then um I got this van and this was like a beat up van on the outside of the van it had stopped fully stopped with parts so I opened up the back doors it is absolutely completely empty but one big brass fitting about that big in the back. There were no shelves. There was nothing, absolutely nothing in there. So I'm driving back to Costa Mesa and I'm driving down the freeway like this, just trying to keep it straight. And um, every time I'd hit the brakes, this big brass fitting would go boom, 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 bang on the back. And then I'd get a fright and it'd almost run off the road. So I got I got back and back in those days, we had the little pages. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the big uh, Thomas, Thomas guide. It was like that thick. With all these pages in it and uh so i got back to my house and i'm just like sitting there i'm like freaking out i'm like if this pager goes off you know i'm, I'm just gonna be terrified uh -huh. <laughs> I'm on like emergency plumbing calls I, I i mean i actually had a business card made and i'd written uh, bob the plumber on it and um about two years later someone said hey bob uh how, how do you spell plumber i said why is that so apparently I'd spelt it P L U M M E R. <laughs> I've been handing these cards out for like two years and no one said anything. <laughs> <laughs> that one time I looked and I thought, you know what? I always thought I looked a bit strange. So, um, <laughs> well, if they weren't impressed by the van, the business, the business card was definitely going to seal the deal. Yeah, oh, for sure. So, um, yeah, I always remember my first call. Um, so I ended up doing the plumbing for four years. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was like it was like the funnest job I ever, I ever had. Real. But um, no, I'll, I'll tell you about my first call. It was real quick. So, um, I, I I got a call actually it wasn't wasn't far from where the um, motorcycle dealer was um, down in San Clemente. So so anyway, I'm, I'm dressed up. I got this van. I'm dressed up, plumbing shirt, nice pants, nice shoes. So I knock on the door, and um, it's this Asian lady, and she's like, "Oh, hello, Robert." Uh, nice to meet you. Come on in, come on in. So I go in and I'm just like kind of trembling, you know. I'm like thinking, oh my God, what's wrong with it? Plumbing. Mean, like, anyway, she she says to me, she goes, oh, so how long have you been a plumber? And I look at my watch and I go, oh, about 30 seconds. And she goes, oh, you're so funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then, yeah, to deliver on that story. So anyway, she had this toilet and the you know the tank was it was running the the, the fill, fill valve was wasn't working so you know I mean I had a pretty good mechanical background but you know so far as plumbing I'd never never right. done anything yeah. so I um I opened it you know top of the tank and I see it's it's kept running it wouldn't shut off so I said to her well um I think it's this I didn't even know what it was it's this valve here. Um, I'll go see if I got one in my van for you. So I go out, <laughs> go down the street. I open the van, I open the doors, and she's kind of like standing by the door, and I'm looking in there, going, yeah, that's like I knew I didn't have, I didn't have any parts. There was nothing. I had, my little, I had my little motorcycle toolkit. It was like this big. <laughs> that's all I had. So I come back in. I said, oh, you know what? Um, we don't have it, but I'm going to go down to our warehouse. It's not far from here, and I'll, I'll get you the valve. And I said, oh, we've got every model but that one. And she goes, oh, okay, come back, okay. So, so I drove off and I went to Home Depot. And um, I'm sitting in my van. I call up Steve because he, he had some experience <laughs> by this stage. And I call him up and I said, hey, I, I, I've got this valve thing at the top. He goes, yeah, dude, it's a, it's a fill valve. He goes, just go into Home Depot and get it. And he goes, H have you got your plumbing shirt on? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, dude, put a sweater on or something. Put a sweater on. I'm like, why? He goes, fuck, you don't want to look like a plumber. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need some help in there. <laughs> yeah, need some help. So I actually put this, I had this black sweater. It was freaking hot. I didn't even know I had it. So I put this sweater on and I go into Home Depot and I, and I look around and I see this fill valve. I couldn't find the right one. So I asked the guy, the guy goes, oh, can I help you? And I said, yeah. So, I mean, I, I just look like, you know, a regular customer. So I said, can I help? He goes, can I help you? And I go, um, yeah, I'm looking for this valve. And he goes, oh, oh it's, uh, it's this one here. And then, so, then I started asking questions like how to install it and stuff, like what, what I should do. Anyway, so he's, he's sort of telling me, and then I started asking a whole bunch of questions. He's like, 
listen, you, I think you really need a plumber. And I go, okay, thanks. <laughs> so I go to Home Depot. I take my sweater off, throw it in the car. I drive back up to the, this lady's house and I go, oh, I've got, I've got the valve. And she's like, oh, great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So I go and I install it. You know, everything was fine. And, um, and then, so then the next job I go to, you know, I walk in and they always seem to ask, oh, how long have you been a plumber? And I go, oh, I'm about an hour and a half. And they'd just crack up laughing, think, think I was, and I was actually telling the truth. So I ended up doing that for four years. I absolutely loved it. It was just every day was different. And, you know, I had my product in the catalogs and I was still mm -hmm. calling um, companies, you know, on the side as well, trying to get, trying to get some um, business and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that was the, the early days of it. So do you, do you do your own plumbing now or do you call it professional? Uh, I, I do mine. <laughs> That's good. Let's learn something along the way. Okay. Yeah. So I, I actually trust myself sometimes. Not all the time. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I think you also had a pretty creative approach to doing some of your. Um, you mentioned construction sites before. You you mentioned um, you mentioned construction sites before. You get a pretty creative approach to market research. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, one of my products. I've done this with the wedges, but I made a, a bigger wedge um, for leveling, which is this jumbo. And this is made of a really hard, high impact okay. uh, ABS material. It's, it's super, super, super strong. So um, I wanted to do some market research with that. Um, so my friend, like I said, was a contractor. So one day I asked him if I could come to work with him. So he's like, yeah, sure, you know, you can help me out. So what I did is I took um, I took about three or four of these with me to the job site, and uh, they were doing framework. And so what I did is that at lunchtime I, um, you know, I was helping my friend, and I went and um, put about four of these out on the job site while the while the workers were at lunch, and I just just put them random places. I just put them down, um, you know, they didn't have the label on it, and um, and I just carried on working. We didn't say, oh, here's a new product, you know, here's a new mm -hmm. product. You should try it, you should use it, you know, you could level stuff. We didn't say anything. I didn't say a thing. I just left them there. And after about an hour, <clears throat> um, I was just sort of watching these guys in the corner of my eye, and I wonder if I'll see it, you know. Eventually they saw it, and one guy grabs it, and he kind of, didn't even ask where it came from. <laughs> he just starts using it. And, he, you know, he's like had a hammer, he's kicking with his foot, you know, up trying to level stuff, he's like kicking with his foot. And um and after a while I was just watching and, and they all ended up using it for different for different uses. So uh then then after, you know, I sort of told them I, you know, it's a it's a new product and they're like, oh we love it. Well we just thought it was a tool that had been around forever. I'm like, no, I actually invented it and built it. And they were like they were shocked. They're like, what? Really? You can't buy it anywhere? I said, no, I've only only kind of just made it. And um, and, I, and I said, oh, what, what do you think you'd sort of use it for? So I got a pretty good idea of what they liked about the product. Mm -hmm. So I could target my uses for that. And then also got really valuable information. And I said, what what would you pay for it? You know, what what do you think you would pay for it? So they were like, you know, I think it was like 12, 12 bucks, $15 back then. They were quite happy. So they pretty much all, you know, set around that price point. So that gave me really valuable information on how I could go back and price the product to distributors. Um, so that was just incredibly invaluable. So if you have a product, you know, don't show your friends, don't have your family comment on it because you already know what they're going to say. If you can get it into, into the market that you think it is, you know, the market it's for and have people that don't know you, have no idea about the product and, and see how they use it. And that's how you'll find I mean, you could spend a hundred thousand dollars on market research. It, it is absolutely a waste of money. Yeah. Take your product, like if I mean, I had a, a kids' product, and I actually took it to like a play center. It was like a kids' ball, and uh, I asked the lady if they could, um, you know, give it to the kids and play. And these kids played with it, and I saw what they did with it, you know, and, and how much they liked it, you know. So doing just stuff like it doesn't cost you anything. 
and it is absolutely invaluable information. It's not, there's no bias at all. And then you can see if you need to modify your product, you know, if, if you like, the, you know, this big jumbo wedge, you know, was it too long? Was it too short? Was it high enough? You know, and you want to find out all that information before you, you know, go to market. So it costs nothing and it's, it's more valuable than what any company could really do for you. Yeah, like, you know, te te test frequently, fail quickly, right? Like tighten yeah. that tighten that feedback loop right up. Um, and yeah, like you, like you said, I mean, you're not, you're not really going to learn anything with the, with the mom test, right? Throw, uh, it, throw, throw it out, throw it out, throw it out in the real world with, with real potential, you know, customers. That's yeah, it's truth, right? Yeah. It's so simple. Yep. Such a simple thing to do. It is, it is, but these things get like over, overthought, right. And, yep. and made a, made a whole lot more, I mean, a whole lot more, uh, you know, complicated than they, they need to be. There, there is a, there's a grittier, scrappier, more startup friendly avenue, um, you yeah. know, to doing, to doing, to doing these things. Um, so I think that's actually, um, you know, pretty good, pretty good segue to the next thing, you know, I want to, I want to ask you about, and that's just, you know, you've been, you've been doing this for a long time. You had, you had some failures, you've had a lot of successes, um, you know, you've, you've probably learned some really interesting business lessons along along the way. Um, do you want to talk about any of those? Yeah, sure. I'm not short of them. Um, I would say, um, okay, so getting your product into, um, I, the one, one of, I mean, okay, my wage sells really well in industrial, in an in industrial account. So there was, um, I was in McMaster Car, which is, you know, in the top, five or ten industrial distributors, you know, I'd been in there for a long time. And it sold really well. So I wanted to get into Granger's, which is, you know, even bigger than um McMaster car. Sure. And this these can be just incredibly difficult. You know, you can apply online. Um I don't even know if they read the like new product submission. Um I mean I, I spent a couple of years just trying to resubmit, resubmit it and they you'd never hear back. This is, I think this is before, well, no, it wasn't before LinkedIn. LinkedIn was around. I don't know if I, um, actually, no, I did use LinkedIn in the end. You know, I had sales reps that um, said, oh, you know, we're, we're exclusive for Grangers. We're going to get your product in there and all this. So they talked to me for about six months, never got it in there. Actually, you know, said, oh, we, we can't get it in there. So anyway, I went on, uh, I went on LinkedIn, that's right, and I found the, uh, so I, I had nothing to lose. Like I'd spent a year or two, a sure. couple of years trying to get it into Granger's. Absolutely no feedback, nothing. So what I did was, I, you know, I had nothing to lose and I was a little bit cheeky. I got, I connected with the CEO of Granger and um, Port Carruthers. And I sent him an, a, a, mess, a LinkedIn message on a Sunday. So I thought Sunday would be a good day to do it because, you know, they're at home relaxing and, you know, maybe they'll just get a chance to look at their phone. So I wrote them a message and I said, uh, Dear Court, your company, your company sucks. I mean, I, I literally wrote this. I said, I have a great USA-made product. I'm a small guy and you guys ignore me. You don't get back to me. How can you run a business like this? Your company really sucks. I literally wrote that. <laughs> because what can happen? What's the worst going to happen, right? <laughs> You're not, you're not going to be any further off than you were by being ignored. Uh, that's for sure. No, absolutely. And I said, you know, I mean, it was not a nice. I mean, I never, never really swore anything. I wasn't crude. I just said your company sucks. I literally wrote that. So I, I'd seen it, and I was sort of laughing to myself. And I go, I put my phone down. I was watching TV. I thought I'm not going to hear from that company again. About ten, ten minutes, not even ten, minutes, five minutes later. My phone, I get a message, I look at my phone, and it's Court Carruthers. And he says to me, Robert, I understand your concerns. Call this guy with the phone number. Monday, you're in. So I call the guy on Monday. He goes, yeah, I've heard from Court, and I've been selling to Grangers ever since. Wow. And stop. So I, I don't recommend that strategy. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna, not gonna work for everyone. 
I don't think it'll get you very far, but um, I mean, it's just a, one of those fluke things. And I mean, I, I'm actually doing orders today for Granger. That was years ago. I mean, I'm trying to think, 2014, I think. It was a long time ago. Well, you never know. You might you might have caught him at the right time. He might have, you know, yeah. might have been reflecting on some of those issues that you were you were pointing out. And, you know, you might have you might have you might have sent that message at just the at just the perfect time. I mean, and you, you did. You, clearly you did. Yeah. You know, uh, like there is a little strategy when you're contacting people. Don't I, I don't contact anyone on a Monday. Mm -hmm. Monday morning oh. is when I just dump with emails. For yep. the, this, excuse me, this long. Um you know, I usually try like, you know, fr a Friday night or, or over the weekend. I'll send mm -hmm. like LinkedIn messages. I, I find I get a better, better response. You know, like yep. I say, there's so many variables, but you know, to get those, you've got to constantly, you know, um, you know, contact these people. You know, you have to keep getting to the top of the email. Um, yep. You know, and, and say, you know, if you're not the right person, can you recommend who is? Yeah, you know, instead yeah. of like saying I have this product and they ignore it, but if you say I have this product, are you the right person? Are you the right buyer for this category? Yeah, and, you know, not always, but sometimes they go, oh no, call this guy, you know, such and such. Here's, you know, here's his contact, and then you get hold of the right person. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Just, just it's just people on the other side of that, right? Yep. Yeah. But if you can do something to stand out too, sure. You know, don't be just write a really, you know, write something with a bit of passion in it, something yep. that gets that human connection. You just say, um, you know, I'm with uh, Southwestern Manufacturing, and I have this, you know, say hi, I'm Bob. I love your, love your LinkedIn. I love your profile. You've done some amazing things. You know, start out with something like that. Yeah, that gets that human connection. You know? more like you would do in person. In right? person. Yeah, I mean, you don't like, you know, drop your resume on somebody before you, you know, get into a conversation over, you know, cocktails at a dinner reception, right? Like, you know, yeah. so yeah. So could you talk a little bit to, uh, like, you know, kind of in the, you know, the business domain, you know, a little bit more about your distribution models? I thought this was pretty creative as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I have one, you know, one product, the multi-wedge. Um how I got into the stores, um, Simon, most of the big ones. Um, I went to a trade show, uh, one of the SEMA trade shows, it's a specialty equipment manufacturers, I think, association. I've been going to that for years. So it's kind of the largest automotive trade show, business to business. So um, I went there, um, little side story. I wanted to visit distributors there. So I'm a manufacturer, and it's a manufacturer's show, so they don't like you taking products in. You know, like they call it suitcasing, where you go and try and sell mm. them to the vendors. You're not, you're not supposed to do that. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to do. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so the first uh, show I went to, I actually um, I wanted to take my wedges in with me. Well, I couldn't do that. So what I did is before I went in, I actually put them in my socks, and I went and got my badge and I walked through and I had all these wedges in my socks. So what I then what I did is I went up to the booth and got one of the bags. You know, they you know, someone will sponsor these bags that everyone puts all their brochures and stuff in. And I went and got that and I, I went out out I went I don't know whether I went, no, I went I think I went to the, the restroom and I took all my wedges out and literature they had and I put it in the bag and then I just walked back into the show. So I had my product, my flyers, everything with me. So th that's how I first got into the show. So um, I went and talked to, I ended up talking to one of the sales reps and said, hey, I want to get my product into all the stores. And I know it's really difficult. So the stores don't want one, one vendor because you know, if you have ten thousand products and you have ten thousand vendors, then it's mm -hmm. just a nightmare. So they like someone to have sort of pretty much all the tools, you know, you know, all the, all the tires, batteries, etc. So the the sales rep recommended that he said, well, you know, you could do a private label, 
for another tool company that's already in there. And I thought, I never really thought about it. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So he gave me a recommendation of a company, a tool company, that was kind of a mid-sized company where you could actually get a hold of people. It wasn't one of the big tool companies. You know, you never really seem to get anywhere. So You didn't, ha- you didn't have to tell them they sucked on a Sunday afternoon? <laughs> no. No. So, um, yep, yeah, so I went and saw this company and I said, hey, can I, you know, I have this tool product. I know I know for a fact that this tool company was in, like, you know, O'Reilly's AutoZone, all of the all the majors. So I said, could I do a private label for you guys? And um, And they said, yeah, for sure. And the guy gave me his card. And so what I did was I, you know, I had my tool, my brand, and I put it in their packaging. So um, I started off doing that in 2011, I think, and I'm still doing that today. So that way you can add. So it looks good for them when they go to a buyer meeting. They go, oh, have you got any new products? Well, they show my product. And it looks good for them, and their development cost is is basically zero. Yeah, right. Didn't cost, didn't cost them anything, um, and it doesn't cost me anything either. So it's a it, you know if you get the right partnership, it can work really well. So I would have you know I did a couple of other private labels, so I'd have the same the same card like this is this is it here. Yeah. Um, this is still current today, so I'd have the same size card. My tools in here with this blister, and then if I got a new private label, all the only thing I'd be changing is basically the artwork yep. for that at tool company. So my costs, if I have a couple of private labels, or my costs are exactly the same. It doesn't change. So the same, the same packaging machine, the same blister, the same size card. The only thing different is the artwork. Right. So. So you have the the only sort of downsides you have to give them a really competitive cost, but then also on the upside is you have no warehousing, no sales reps, no employees. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So <clears throat> so it works really you know it works really well. I've been doing that for uh, 2011. Today I'm still doing it today. So are they, are they doing the actual um, manufacturing and inventory storage as well then for those private labeled labeled products? All right, no, I I do all of it. I do you do that part though, okay? So I have a manufacturer in um, California, okay, actually uh, Compton, um, that does all the manufacturing. Um, it's a really nice family. They have molded my wedges since 1999. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and they still do it today. I'm doing orders right now with them. And the kind of really cool story I really like is one of the ladies that started packaging my wedges when I first first started. I've been doing it that long that her daughter grew up and she's now working and packaging my wedges with her mother. A <laughs> <laughs> multi-generational family yeah. operation now. Yeah, so I mean they're a great they're a great we've had a great relationship. Um, I mean, some of my distributors, I don't have contracts at all. I don't have any agreements. The agreements are, are verbal. I, you know, I don't recommend it. I'm just saying, in my, you know, in my uh, my world, that's what I, that's what I've done. You know, we've talked about. Um, you know, the guy said, "Well, you know, we're not going to rip you off. We'll buy from you, and um, you know, we're, we're not going to knock your product off." and and uh, it was basically a handshake, you know, 15 years ago, and it's still good. I mean, I give them really good pricing too, and I look after them. Like my my molder, I pay him the same day. You know, a few times he's called up, said, "Hey, can I borrow?" One time he said, "Oh, can I borrow twenty thousand dollars?" I said, "Sure." I sent him twenty thousand dollars. You know, just by, and he ended up sending it back. He didn't need it. Just you know, when you get a a dip in business, then you, you know you just need a little bit of. So that that's the kind of relationship you know we've had since nine like twenty five years. So his son has just taken over in the last couple of weeks. That's um, great. I mean, you treat you you know you treat people well. 
that's what that's what I feel. I mean, you can have the you know a twenty thirty page contract, you know, and it, you know if someone's going to take advantage of you, they're going to do it with or without a contract. Yep. You know, that's yep. been my experience anyway. Yep. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Ex ex exactly. And then you get to and then you get to fight it out in court. So yeah, work with <clears throat> work with people you can trust. Hire people you can trust. Partner with people you can trust. Right. You know, you, I, I, you know, I get a gut feeling when I'm talking to somebody. Absolutely. I'm not always right, but, you know, nine times out of ten, I'm right. Yep. And, but, you know, if you're dealing with a big corporation that, you know, that's not very friendly, like not on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, then, you know, a contract's really valuable. Yep. You know, but... Yep. Um, they should yeah, really be. They should really be called disagreements, right? Because right. <laughs> that's when that's when they're that's when they're used. Yeah. So one one more, um, because we you know we we cater to inventors. It's so, so much so much of our audience here. Um, what's the what's the biggest piece of advice you'd give to those um, newer to inventing? Um, I, I would really focus on the market research of the product. You know, to me, that's really core. Cool. Like, actually finding out if it's a good product from from the very beginning, before you invest a lot of time and money in it. Um, like I said, my little uh, story about putting my wedges on the job site. I yeah. think absolutely 100% focus on that, and that is going to give you invaluable information on the product design, um, the uses for it. So then you can cater your market from from day one to that, you know, to your, your core customer. You know, what, what you're passionate about may not be what the customer is passionate about. Um, so absolutely number one above everything I would put doing proper market research. Like a classic example when I thought of the Yamaha dealership, that was my passion. That's what I thought. And I, I was completely wrong. Completely wrong. Yeah. So... Um, you know, and also these other, you know, there could be other uses for your product that you have never thought of. Um, so like having little focus groups is invaluable as well. So just the core of, a, of your product has to start out with really, really good market research. Absolutely critical. I mean, it can be a lot bigger than you thought, depending on the market. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and I think, you know, passion obviously is is a huge part of that too. Um, I can't remember if you said to me in person or I saw it in a video once, but you said that you know, one one of the most you know obviously everybody wants to make money in doing these things, but you said you know one of the most important things is you know inventing is is doing it for nothing because there's a good chance your product won't work anyway, so you haven't, you haven't lost anything, you know. Um, and I think that you know no, nobody goes into it not wanting to make anything, but there's there's something to be said about you know following your passions, building what building what you want, and you know soaking all of your own equity, your own sort of sweat equity into it. Um, because you're probably going to end up with a better product, and then if it, like you said, if it doesn't work, you're you know you're not you're not out you're not out as much. All right. Thought there was thought there was thought there was a lot of wisdom in that. Um, and you know too, just like kind of in you know wrapping up a little bit um you know not not everyone out there is going to have to dodge you know bullets um or maybe benefit from crossing paths with you know one of the one of the most uniquely qualified CMOs uh chief marketing officer just the right time um but i think that you know so much of what you've done uh broadly applies or you know could apply to to so many inventors right i mean you you personally discovered a problem and you used a skill set that you had developed to seek out a solution for that. Um, you didn't over leverage yourself or give up control of your company to investors, right? Like instead right. you found a minim minimally viable facility to work in a uh, good old Bob's machine shop. Uh, you did a side hustle to keep yourself fed, you know, with, uh, with learning how to be a plumber on the job. And uh, you know, you applied your own sweat equity, to the R and D um, your initial vision didn't meet your, what you thought, uh, was going to be product market fit, but you kept your eyes open. You looked for new opportunities and you pivoted, um, you know, and then you found really creative ways to to gain market traction and, you know, come up with a, a, a clever distribution system. And I just think like broadly speaking for everyone out there, you know, inventing is both the big and the small and it's, you know, it's collectively all of these, all of these little inventions, um, you know, from wedges to everything and beyond that like make up the, the miracle that is, is modern life. 
Um, and it's really about recognizing some need, you know, tirelessly working towards a solution like you have, um, and, you know, and then staying staying nimble um, and open to the to sort of the new opportunities and paths that, that might just sort of present themselves along the way. And um, I just want to say personally, you know, I I love the journey you've taken, um, what you've learned along the way, the decisions you've made from that. And, uh, you know, I, I really think it's it's like the great American, you know, in, invention story, in, in my opinion. So um, I hope others get a lot out of this. I know, I know, I know I did. Um, so for, for what it's worth, like, you know, congratulations on the, on the successes and, um, and, and again, for what's worth, like fantastic work on, do, on, on, on doing it the right way. You know, I, what I, I, what we think, what we think is the right way. Um, so, and yeah, and just thank you for taking all of this time and, and, and sharing those experiences with me and with our audience. Um, I think that, I think the folks are going to get a lot out of this. Right. No, I think, thanks for having me. And I, I really enjoy um, telling my story and I absolutely love helping, you know, inventors with their ideas. You know, I get, a, I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Um, I think it's really important, you know, for the economy, for people to keep inventing and, you know, finding solutions for even simple things, you know, I really yes. enjoy it. And, you know, I'm as passionate today about my product as I was 25 years ago. I still, still hundred percent believe in it. Yep. But, yep. 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 You can tell for anybody who's just listening to the podcast, uh, you know, you won't, you won't see for those, for those, uh, those on YouTube, you know, Robert's been, you know, grinning ear to ear talking about this stuff, the, you know, the entire, the entire time. And, uh, yeah, I think that really, that really says something. Find, find something you enjoy doing. You're not going to work a day in your life. So, and, and every, and every now and then you get to hop on a, a jet ski and, uh, you know, take it down to Bimini Island. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have some fun too. You do. You really do. All right. Well, thank thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate it. Okay. No, thanks, Josh. It's been super fun.